It's a beautiful day for a Bible trip, a beautiful day for some tripping. Would you like to go with your homies, oh? All right, bud. Okay, let me get settled in here. One of these days, I'm going to remember the rest of that song. What's up, Sharon? How you doing, buddy? Oh, man. What am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about, let me see, we're going to read a little bit up from, how, how was you guys this weekend? You guys doing good? It's a, I hope the weekend didn't go by too fast for you guys. It's like the week, the week for me goes by like real slow. And then, no, 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 I take that back. I take that back. No, all week and even through the weekend, everybody, everything just seems to go by like really fast. Now, if anybody thinks that like time goes by like really fast, what's up, Prophet? How you doing, brother? Uh, if time it feels like it goes by really fast, there's it's like, man, I don't have enough hours in the day. It just seems like I just woke up and already the sun has gone down. If it ever feels like time is going by like really fast, there's a remedy for that. Try fasting. Fasting will slow the day down like you wouldn't believe. It's like, yo, it seems like it ain't going to be until next week until this fast is over. That is unless you're fasting for about a week. Then it's going to seem like, you know, the week is going to take like a month long. But uh, that's a way to help time seem to slow down if time seems to be going by really fast for you. Uh, I, 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 I did my fast last week. And I hope you guys weren't able to tell. I hope you guys still saw me as my same bubbly self, even though I'm like, man, if, if, if the cat better not walk by, because if the cat walks by, she might be in danger. Uh, so, you know, I, I might eat you and your treats and, and everything else, you know, trying to get through this fast. But hopefully you guys didn't notice that, you know, but maybe, you know, if I, if I look a bit, you know, if I look a little bit slimmer or something like that, you know, if you want to point that out, I'll take that. I'll take that too. And it's like, so man, what's wrong, man? You look like you're on meth or something. It's like, no, fool. I just been fasting. Don't be trying to don't uh -uh. play it. I don't, I don't play that. All right. So let's see. So I'm glad you guys are, are doing well. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for showing up. What's up, Pam? I see you. How you doing, buddy? Oh, what do I have the meat, <laughs> meat and cheese fast? What is it? Now, meat and cheese fast, what do you mean by that? That's, that, that's all you're going to eat? It's just meat and cheese or you got to take a, a fast from the meat and cheese? What, what, which one is that? Meat and cheese. Sausage and cheese. So I'm already looking forward to breakfast. No, I don't get to have breakfast because I'm starting. I'm going to fast again. I'm going to fast again tomorrow. Let's see if I can hold out. Um, let me see. Let me put this on up here. Uh oh. Zoe remembered his coffee. It's on now, baby. Okay. <laughs> it's on. I don't even have my page mark of where I'm supposed to be starting. Yeah, Zoe. You ready, man? You are ready. I hope you guys are ready. Let's see. I'm. I'm. On, I think I'm only gonna do. I'm gonna do one. Cha I think I'm gonna do one chapter today because this chapter is loaded, man. This is this chapter is loaded. We we gonna get dangerous with it. What's up, Danielle? Danielle, how you doing, buddy? AP. Hey, that's right. Coffee, coffee, the nectar, the nectar of the Lord. That's what it is. Mmm. Okay. So in this in this chapter right here, in Mark um, in Mark 13, um, it's one chapter, man, but it's um. There's a lot of uh, implications going on in here. And I got to let you go, know, guys. Now, once again, you know, I know I keep saying this. Just remind y'all, I'm studying with y'all. I'm not I'm not claiming to be, you know, Zoe professor up here, Joe Zoe professor or pastor or anything like that. I'm just sharing my observations with you. And we read along together. So it's not a point of, you know, if I, if I say something, if I give you an observation or something like that, uh, it's coming based on this. This isn't me like reading something and say, hmm, let's see where we can go off from here. And then I'll go and I, I'll read some some external writings or something like that and try to, you know, put pieces together. Because I'm, I'm a firm believer. I'm a firm believer that everything that the Lord wanted us to know is in here. All right. People, you know, God didn't give us a book. He didn't give us this book just so we could be confused. That don't make no sense. God is not a God of confusion. So, you know, in the, and in this book, people went to a, a bloody death, making sure that we got the information that's in this book. So I don't I don't think for one second that we're supposed to read this book and be like, I wonder what it means. No, God gave us this word so we'll know what time it is. 
is and all you got to what you got to do is you got to you got you got to let him in and say, Lord, you authored this book and I trust you to help me understand it. So, um, you know, there. But now that being said, you know, and like I said before, the Bible wasn't written, you know, it wasn't recorded. You know, there's there's not one testimony in this book. There's a you know, we got several, you know, testifiers in this book. So just as it wasn't written by one person, you know, it's not going to be one person who understands it. We got to understand it as a community. We got to hold each other accountable to what this book says. So, you know, we share our observations on it, you know, and square it by the word. You know, it's like, OK, you know, let's let's go ahead and we can't just take one verse by one verse or anything like that. We got to We got to read it all. So, you know, we got to look at what it says in the OT. We got to look at what it says in the new T and uh, say, OK, well, this is squaring up with that. This is square. Hey, Zoe, you know, hey, uh, how about this? You know, or hey, you know, Chris, you know, how, well, how about this? You know, this is saying this, you know, so how do we you know, square this up to where it balances out? So the word is consistent. Uh, so, you know, when I read these, you know, read it order. You know, and uh, I'll give my observations on it and you'll know exactly where my observations are coming from because I sat here and I read it with you. Um, so that being said, let's take a look at, uh, you know, at 13. And, uh, you know, we got the we got the guest of honor, the Holy Spirit here to, you know, in our fellowship because, you know, we're here in agreement. And so, you know, he said that he'll be here with us, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to party with us and make sure that, you know, we keeping the party, you know, keeping it hearty and, 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 and level headed. Um, so let's see. Let's take it from 13. Uh, let's see what we got. Let's see what we got. Mark 13, uh, chapter 13, verse. I promise I can count one. There it is. Who else we got? Hey, Stacy, how you doing? Daniel. What's up, brother? <laughs> OK. As he was going out of the temple complex. One of his disciples said to him, teacher, look, what massive stones, what impressive buildings. Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? <laughs> and Jesus, I can imagine just Jesus' disciple saying, yeah, Jesus, I do see the buildings because I'm the one who just said, hey, look, what impressive building. Jesus be like, hey, man, don't get smart, man. I'm, I'm trying to make a point here. You just, you, just, you just watch yourself, buddy. Okay, you don't want me to, you know, you saw what I did to that fig tree, right? No, <laughs> Jesus ain't going to do that. Okay, so Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here on another that will not be thrown down. Okay, so now Jesus, <clears throat> as we've come, you know, we, as, we, as we've talked about before, Jesus doesn't say anything that he can't back up. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how hyperbolic it sounds. You know, Jesus is relating to the tradition of, um, you know, when Jews, you know, speak culturally, it's not like they're big, tall tellers or anything like that. It's, it's just that their, their history and stuff like that is, is passed on, you know, through orations. So they have to, when they, when they speak, you know, they, they kind of, you know, speak in very exaggerated terms. When you speak in terms like that, it, it helps you remember, hey, Nancy, how you doing? Thanks for, thanks for, thanks for coming to trip with us. Um, you know, so, you know, when you, when you do things like that, it, it helps to, you know, keep, preserve. Preserve your, your culture, preserve your history, and things like that. So, you know, when Jesus is saying these things, he's, he's, he's relating to them in that sense. It's, but the thing is with Jesus, Jesus relating to them culturally and how they, how they you know, keep their uh, traditions and their, and their history and stuff like that. But the thing is, is that Jesus can actually back up his exaggerated statements. That's, that's the difference. It's like, no, and Jesus is trying to get it through his head. like, no, dude, I'm not speaking hyperbolically. I am literally going to do this. And I've literally done this, or this is literally going to happen, or this literally has happened. And just so you're not confused about it, if it's going to happen, it's happened before, it will happen again. So Jesus, you know, when he speaks, you know, he can back up what he says. So when he's telling them that, uh, you know, this, this building is coming down, um, you know, there's, there's no confusion there. Now, the thing, it the, the thing of it is, it has happened, right? It was, this building was destroyed. Right. Rome took it out. Now, some would argue that that um, that uh, Jesus, he messed up. You know, the, the, the prophecy wasn't completely fulfilled because there's still a wall standing. I'm assuming they're talking about that wailing wall. Right. Well, Jesus didn't complete. He didn't fulfill his this. This, this prophecy wasn't fulfilled because there was there's this wall still standing. OK, well, if there's a wall that's still standing there. That does not mean that this prophecy wasn't fulfilled. Now, once again, I'm speculating because maybe I, you know, who knows 
the full scope of what Jesus meant. I can't say, you know, it's in the Bible. It depends on, you know, uh, you know if we're going to calculate it correctly, because the Bible does says, let he who has wisdom calculate. OK, so we are supposed to 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 uh, understand what's supposed to, what's written in this Bible now. But I'm going to speculate that that wall, the reason why that wall didn't come down is because that wall is proof that there was a temple there. That's why that wall is still standing, because Jesus knows better. Jesus knows that people are going to look for any reason to try to doubt something. So you got to leave. Hey, Mary, how you doing? Thanks for joining us. Um, you got to leave a remnant. So when people are trying to say that, uh, well, Jesus's prophecy didn't come true because there's a wall still standing. It's like, no, 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 no. There's still a wall there because that wall is evidence. There's still a wailing wall there, and it's evident that there was a temple there. Now, if, if Jesus, if the full scope of that wall came, if everything came down, if everything was demolished, then there would be no evidence that would there. And then people would say, well, there, there's a wall there because it never existed. And we got proof of that. We can look at the Holocaust. You got people who said that there was no Holocaust. And we got records of the Holocaust. But people try to still say that the Holocaust never existed. So Jesus knew what he was doing. It's almost like even with Je Jesus himself. Jesus wasn't supposed to be named Jesus. We were supposed to call him Emmanuel, but we don't call him Emmanuel, even though he is Emmanuel. Because what does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. Well, when Jesus was born, surely it was God with us. But we're not going to call him Emmanuel because the prophecy says he's going to be Emmanuel. And if we name Emmanuel, when King Herod would, then Herod would know who to look for now, wouldn't he? So for the protection, just like Moses was hidden, Jesus was hidden too. And Jesus was given a different name so we wouldn't know who he is again. Or, uh, so so, the, so uh, Herod would not know who he is and wouldn't know who, exactly who to track down and have murdered. So this is another one of those instances where you're going to have to change a little something so the future generations can say, ah, there's a remnant. There's still a wall there. So there was a temple there. And uh, so Jesus' uh, prophecy did come to pass. Uh, so moving on, let's look at... While he was sitting on a Mount of Olives across from the temple complex, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Hey, Jesus, now that we got you here for a second, man, we want to ask you something. Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to take place? Okay, now we're we, we about, we get, we about to get into the weeds here, man. We're going to get into the weeds. But we got to trust that the Lord is not a Lord of uh, is not a Lord of confusion. Uh, he wants us to understand. So if we trust him, we may not get all the answers that we want. But uh, if, if, if at best, we're not going to be confused, but we'll be asking better questions. Uh, so let's you know, let's uh, let's pray for that. OK, then Jesus began by telling them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying I am he. And they will deceive me. Okay, now right here, this is one of those, I, 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 I've camped out here for a bit because I'm trying to understand the language here. And I have to take into consideration that being that this was written, you know, he's speaking to, he's speaking to Jews, this was written in Greek and stuff like that. So, you, you know, you kind of got to get a feel of what is the cultural implications of what he's saying? What's the attitude and what he's talking about right here? You know, so these things I don't know. So I'm trying to, hey, Melissa, how you doing? Yay, glad you could join us. How you doing, Linda? Um, so what, 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 what's, what's the implications here? When he says, many will come in my name saying, I am he. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. Now, here's, now this is one of the ways that Jesus is letting us know what's coming down the pipe, right? So... When people come, I don't know, I don't really know of throughout history, you know, of, of a bunch of people having a, um, a wide influence, whether it be within their regions or whether it be, you know, abroad, like globally. I don't know of people having that kind of influence going around saying that they are Jesus or saying that they are the, the Messiah. Hey, hey, Emery. My hat, my hat. Love you back, though. <laughs> um, so. I don't know. Now, when a person wants to have great power and influence, we look throughout history. Um, people having great power and influence are usually megalomaniacs. They don't they don't try to assume power so much in the name of calling themselves Jesus. Uh, they may even say things that they're doing things uh, uh, like even Hitler, uh, I think, said, I'm doing the Lord's work. 
right? Now, this is a gross violation of taking the Lord's name in vain. God says, do not take my name in vain. Don't go out committing sins and assume to justify it by dropping my name. Don't do that. Okay, so even if Hitler, Hitler, who was no Christian, Hitler was actually a big pagan. But Hitler, you know, uh, uh, you know, assuming that, uh, that he's doing something for the Lord, he wasn't doing anything for the Lord. He was doing it for himself. It was, his actions were completely selfish. Um, and he was drawn, and his, and his whole thing was basically about him. And this, is, this represents a lot of leaders, you know, who, who are tyrants. They don't, they don't go out there professing to be, even, even if Hitler was uh, um, uh, saying that he was doing it for the Lord, he himself didn't claim to be the Messiah that I know of. And that goes for a lot of leaders who have a whole bunch of influence. These are megalomaniacs who don't do things assuming to be the Messiah. Now, you, you have made people who think that they themselves are God. We got history of people thinking that they're gods on earth. From Pharaoh to uh, 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 to, to Alexander to C, you know, Caesars and stuff like that, they they consider themselves uh, uh, earthly gods, you know, uh, god kings on earth. But messiahs, I don't know. And I'm saying all that because in here, when it's saying many will come, saying I am He, I don't I don't really know if that's the same as a person himself saying that I am God. Or are they are they going to come in my name? Like Jesus, you saying many are going to come in my name saying that I, Jesus, am he. They'll say they'll, they'll be like, yeah, yeah, I come in the name of the Lord and I agree that Jesus is the Messiah. Is that what he's saying when he says I am he? Pointing, that meaning that they're pointing to Jesus. Now, I can, that's easier to back up because the script, we, hadn't we read the scriptures or hadn't we already talked about where um, where Jesus says, hey, many are going to be saying, Lord, Lord, you know, I've driven out demons in your name and I prophesied in your name and stuff like that. And Jesus is going to be, man, I don't know you. Right. So people are going to come in, in, and talk about how, you know, they're all about Jesus and stuff like that. But they're going to deceive people. Right. Or they themselves are deceived. You know, they may call on Jesus name, but they really don't know the full scope of what it is to be a follower of Christ. So. That kind of, to me, this kind of speaks to that. Or you're going to have these different religions. You're going to have these different uh, doctrines and stuff like that that are going to be proclaiming the Lord, but not really teaching the truth of, of, of his gospel. They're not going to be teaching the truth. So that's this right here, I'm wondering what is the implication here when they say Jesus began telling them, watch that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying I am he. Now, consider the last thing I said. Yeah, there has been that. Many have come in the name of the Lord saying that, you know, you got different, you know, whether it's, um, you know, like you got maybe Jehovah's Witness or, or, or things like that. They will say that, yeah, we believe uh, uh, that there was a Jesus Christ. Right. But they got a They got a They got a different book, though. Their book is a little bit different. The, the wording is different. They have a different idea of who Jesus is. They don't call themselves Jesus' witnesses. They call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. They're not witnessing for Jesus Christ. They'll acknowledge Jesus Christ, but not the acknowledgement that Christians understand Jesus Christ to be. So they'll come in his name, but at the same time, we'll have a, an, an idea of Jesus that doesn't square with, with, uh, with actual scripture. So um, now, of course, Jehovah's Witnesses will argue, argue against that. I ain't trying to pick a fight with them, but, you know, but let's, let's, let's be real. Um, Many are going to come in his name saying I, that Jesus is Jesus, but they're going to deceive many. Um, now, it goes on from 13 to 7, saying, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. These things must take, must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. So... It sounds like all these things are already happening. Sounds like they've always happened, right? That's one would, one would argue and say, man, there's always been earthquakes. There's always been famines. There's always been wars. There's always been rumors of wars. And, uh, you know, so it's like, how is this generation any different than any other generation? Well, one of the things is, is that it tells you at the end, these are the beginning of birth pains. It's the frequency, right? So we've, you know, a lot of us in the Christian community, we, you know, we've heard this before. You know, it's like, okay, we understand that. In the frequency, it's like these these contractions just keep they become more frequent and they become more intense. We're starting to see a lot more of it. Um, we can see a lot more of it in the terms of you know we have global communication. We can see these things just mounting up all the time. You know, it's it's happening. Um, you know, and I think uh, 
you know, where it, where it talks about these earthquakes. You know, I looked it up. I tried to, you know, I, you know, finding out what does it mean in the Greek. And it, and it says with these earthquakes in, uh, in these various places, it almost sounds like, um, you know, these earthquakes, it, it, it seems to point to these earthquakes, they're regional. These earthquakes are going to be taking place, you know, around where Jesus was talking about. They're regional earthquakes. Um, so that brings me to uh, things like, uh, actually, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit. And it has something to do with the dome on the rock. Um, you guys, some of y'all probably know where I'm going with this. You know, you probably speculated on it as well. Uh, so, so hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up. We'll get there in just a second, but you know, just wanted to throw that out. Remind, remind me in case I go rambling and I forget, you know, you guys can reel me in and, uh, and say, Hey, so man, you know, why are you being all ADD and stuff? Why don't you get back to that thing you was talking about with the, with the, with the dome on the rock? What's up, Jeffrey? How you doing, man? Um, okay. Persecution is predicted, uh, but be on your guard. They will hand you over to Sanhedrin. Now, there's, there's also the question of, is Jesus talking to his contemporaries or is Jesus talking about to all, to, to all generations, to like future generations? You know, what's, you know, who, who are we speaking to here? Who, what's, what's going to go down? And we know that uh, Jesus intermingles it all. Remember, this, this is God. He sees every, he sees the whole shebang bang. He sees the whole thing. So when he speaks to one culture, he's speaking to all. So it's even if he's talking to these guys, it's not a bad idea for us to kind of like take a cue from it, take a heads up to know what's coming. You know, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. So we get we're getting some insight into what has happened then to prepare us for what's happening now and what's going to happen in the future. So, you know, take you know, we might want to take that into consideration. Uh, but you you be on your guard. They will hand you over to Sanhedrin's and you will be flogged in the synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings because of me as a witness to them. And the good news must first be proclaimed to all nations. So I reckon that's going to happen because, you know, when they're up in the, uh, when they're in the upper room and they got people from different nations standing around and they're out there, you know, prophesying, they're prophesying in, 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 in a multitude of national tongues. They're not up there speaking gibberish, right? They're, they're not up there doing the, you know, they're not doing that. They're speaking, the, the miracle is that they're speaking legitimate languages and people from other nations are here. They are prophesying to all nations. So these, I would say, you know, this is one of those things that has happened. All right. Nice. All right. Appreciate that, Matthew. <laughs> um, so when they arrest you and hand you over, don't worry beforehand about what you will say. On the contrary, whatever is given to you, in that hour, say it, squaring with the scripture of, lean not on your own understanding, you lean on the Lord. The Lord is the one who fortifies what we're saying. He fortifies with this, pray about it, study it, study it, pray about it, right? Um, so, let's see. Say it, for it isn't you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Then brother will betray brother to death, and a father, his child, children will rise up against parent and put them to death. And you will be hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be delivered. Now, in there, um, once again, this, this isn't, this isn't far-fetched from what's happening today. Like, say, for instance, when you, got, uh, when you got Israel, Israel doesn't seem, it doesn't look like Israel can depend on, you know, their, their secular Jewish brothers, like here in the States. Um, you know, and, and once again, you know, I don't want to speak ill, you know, of my Jewish brothers and sisters, but, you know, I think it's a shame that Israel can't count on their Jewish counterparts, like here in the States, you know, who will sell them out and, 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 and uh, and conform to arguments that, that, that Israel should be divided or, or, or capitulate to, uh, this Palestinian idea, you know, that's, that's selling your brother out. You, you, you selling your brother down the river. You know, Israel, Israel is, uh, is uh, you know, is in peril. It's surrounded by people who want to destroy them. And you don't, and we have, you know, these Jewish liberals, you know, in, in the States, you know, who, who are, uh, um, who give the benefit of the doubt to Islamic ideas. And that's, uh, that's very sad. That's something that's got to stop. And, you're, and, and you've been warned about it. Not only have you been warned about it, it's a lot of this book shows about how, you know, too often they keep selling each other out. They keep selling God out. And, uh, and what happens, what ends up coming down the pipe is, is oppression and murder. So in this right here, the Bible is telling you again, 
the, uh, then brother will betray brother to death. So when we got these, you know, secular Jews over here uh, selling out Israel, you're, you're, you're giving them a death sentence. You're, 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 you're emboldening their enemies to destroy them um, and father his child. Now, even in Israel, I got to call out Israel. A father, his child. Father is going, is going to betray his child. You know in, in what way Israel betrays their children? Israel is pro-abortion. They, 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 they abort their kids at ridiculous rates, right? How are you going to do that? Israel, that, I mean, you know, that, that don't make any sense. You got people trying to kill you. They trying to wipe you off the face of the map. And they're getting help from you because y'all are pro-abortion. Why don't y'all stop that? I, I, I reckon y'all need as many of you as you can get. You trying to destroy your own population? Won't y'all stop doing that? Y'all have people trying to kill you. Israel, seriously, stop aborting your kids. Not cool, man. Um, so let's see. And you will be hated. By, okay, we read that. So let's get down to uh, the Great Tribulation. When you see... Okay, now this is where we're going to start really getting uh, a little kooky here. Or I am anyway. Let's get weird. Um, now, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it should not be, let the reader understand. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. All right. Now, you know, my wife and I were talking about this and, you know, we talk about this, uh, uh, you know, in trying to understand, you know, what this means in, 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 uh, in, the, in the church. Um, the thing is about this happening, it ha Israel has to be at least a state first. And we've seen that happen in 1948. So these things are happening. These, these are plausible to happen now because Israel has been, you know, restored. Right. It's a, it's a new state now. So these things can, can very well be coming to uh, pass pretty soon. Uh, that being said, before we get to there, uh, and I want I also want to touch on, um, you know, the generation, you know, that sees this. At least I'll try to, if, if, uh, if time permits and if I see the, the, the verse come up again. Um, I, I want to play with this, with this uh, abomination that causes des desolation. Standing where, it, <laughs> standing where it should not be. This may sound a little, you know, like I'm trying to be facetious here, right? It may sound like I'm trying to be facetious, but at the same time, I'm being serious. The abomination that causes desolation standing where it should not be. We're being, what is an abomination? Basically, an abomination is something that is willfully against the natural, right? When you do something that's not natural. Um... You know, this is an abominable act. When you do something that conflicts with the law of nature. <laughs> See, now that you said drink, man, I'm going to be saying right all the time. Oh, no. Oh, no. Your, your fault. Your fault. I think I was doing pretty good, personally. I was I was fine. I, I, I was thinking it's like, man. I, matter of fact, just before you said that, I was thinking, you know, I hadn't said right in a minute. And then there, and then there you go. You, you know why you did that? You know why you did that? Because you like it when I say right. That's why. Everybody likes it. You say, right? Because I'll be like, I'll be reading. It's like saying amen to myself. Say, right? Right? Can I get it right? And, um, but anyway, I'm, 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 I'm going to try to dial that back. But it might come out a lot because I'm drinking coffee. So I might be like, right, 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 right. All right. Dang it. Um, so the abomination that causes desolation. The thing is... The, now, what I'm tripping on is, is that this, this thing is called the abomination. What this thing does isn't an abomination. What this thing is is an abomination. So I just think that's, that's, a, that's an interesting thing to look at. When you see the abomination that causes des desolation standing where it should not be. Now, usually when the Bible is talking about something that has, you know, this sentient being, if it has a consciousness or something like that, if it has a personality, if it has any sort of personification at all, usually the Bible will assign a gender to it. It'll let you know if it's a male or female. It'll, you know, it'll, it'll be specific with its gender. I think it's kind of interesting that this abomination that is coming is not referred to a he or a she. It's an it. So that got me to thinking. I don't know, think a little bit. 
When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it should not be. Remember, abomination is something that goes against nature. Now, this thing, what this thing is doing isn't an act of going against nature. It itself is against nature. So I think it's kind of straight. It almost like it caught, I, caught, I catch myself entertaining the idea that this abomination is transgender. Yeah, I said it. Okay, listen. It doesn't define it as a he or a she. And I think it's kind of funny that it says that it's standing where it should not be. So if you see a dude in the ladies' restroom saying that I'm really a woman, I say to you or surely that dude is standing where he should not be. And I think it's kind of interesting that this uses that language, that this abomination, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, y'all, it would not surprise me at all. Because of what we're, and when you, when you consider our culture, consider our culture, aren't we so pressed to embrace what is not natural? Aren't we, aren't we being so pressed to um, embrace other people's delusion? We have, to, we have to endorse it. You have to endorse other people's delusion. If a person says that he's a woman, if a man says he's a woman, you got to accept their delusion. You have to accept things that are against nature. You have to accept things that are contrary to your beliefs. If you don't, you're a hater, you're intolerant, and you're violating somebody's civil rights. It is becoming a freaking law, a law, that you have to accept somebody else's delusion. It is a law that you have to capitulate to someone else's ideas that are a gross conflict with your own. So I don't think I'm being too far-fetched. When the world is faced with the abomination, the abomination, remember, this thing is called an abomination, not what it does, what it is. And if you are a person who is acting out of what is natural for you, if you are a man and you decide that you want to change yourself into a woman, you haven't done an abominable act. You are an abominable act. Sorry to say it. You know, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to, when I, when I cut you, I'm not trying to cut you like a street thug or try to cut you like a murderer. I'm trying to cut like a surgeon to heal. It's not a malicious cut. I'm not trying to be mean, right? Not, I'm not here being intolerant. Let's speak the truth. We're a generation that wants to keep it real, right? That's all I'm doing. I'm keeping it real with you. And this stuff isn't natural. And when you do something that's against the natural, it's an abomination. Now, if you try to make yourself that is something unnatural, you yourself are the abomination. So it doesn't seem far-fetched to me. Once again, speculation is speculation. That's why we're reading it together. So based on what I read, that's where I, I, I come to that conclusion. And I should even say conclusion is the right word because who knows? I may get a different revelation on it. Uh, I'm just speculating, you know, and hoping that the Lord will, you know, reveal uh, the, the actual truth to us. And I think he appreciates that we're searching. All right. Let's see. Now, a man on the rooftop, when this happens, a man on the housetop must not come down or go into, get into his house to get anything. And a man in the field must not go back to get his clothes. Woe to pregnant women and nursing mother in those days. Pray it won't happen in winter. I think that's, that's, that's an interesting thing, right? He says, pray it doesn't happen in winter. It just goes to, to me, it just goes to show that even when God is, when is dropping the judgment, even when the judgment comes, God is still going to be merciful, right? Because he says, pray this stuff, this stuff doesn't come down in winter. You mean, because regardless of what the judgment is coming, but we can actually pray, you know, it's like, look, you know, Lord, we know that this judgment is coming, but in this, and at the time has come where I'm starting to seek you and I'm starting, I'm going to pray. Right? I'm going to pray. So God may be like, okay, you know, the judgment's coming, but you know what? Instead of doing it in, in a bone chilling air of winter, maybe, you know, hey, maybe I'm in a little bit better mood and I'll bring the judgment down like, you know, in the later part of summer or something like that. You know, maybe in the fall where the weather's a little bit nicer. Um, so I'm not being, you know, fully positioned. <laughs> Stop it, Linda. Leave me alone. Don't be fun of me. Um, so I think that's, a, that's an interesting. And that's, you know, what we want to be, that's what we want to be now. We want to be prayed up. Uh, you know, maybe to the degree that the world starts to pray to the Lord may have an effect on how the judgment comes down. Maybe not how so much how it comes down, but maybe when. Because, uh, you know, it, it, I guess it'd be nice to have some better weather when the judgment comes. 
Um, but the Lord does suggest, like, hey, you better, you might want to pray because uh, this can come. This uh, Jesus, could, he's like, you know, we could do this, you know, the hard way. It's gonna be the hard way, or we could do this the really hard way. Because um, I tried, I tried to do it the nice way. I tried to do it the easy way for you guys. You guys hung me on a stick for it. Uh, so next time when I come back, you know, we we gonna have some issues. <laughs> um, for those days of tribulation, the kind that hasn't been from the beginning of the world for the world which God created until now and never will be again. So that's basically God saying the world has never seen anything like the judgment that is getting ready to come down. Never. Nobody's ever seen it in the world. And it's going to come down like that because the world is going to be pretty dang messed up. It's going to be pretty wicked. And the judgment that is going to be due the wickedness of the world is going to be pretty freaking epic and not epic in, in a, in a cool way. Um, so let's see. Uh, then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, look there, but don't believe it. Um, for they are false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and will perform signs and wonders to lead astray. If possible, the elect, and you must watch. I have told you everything in advance. Okay. I'm glad, I'm glad I just read that and, and remember that, listen, whatever, you know, you know, you got a lot of people out there, you know, despite what denomination they're in, you know, think of themselves as, as Christians, you know, that's, that's fine. Um, but here's the thing. If you don't believe in the rapture, resurrection and stuff like that, you will be among those who are deceived. And this it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's really very simple. Anybody, anybody can be fooled by a false messiah. Anybody can be fooled by a false prophet. Um, the way Jesus is going to meet us, you can't mistake it. That's the thing. Jesus is going to meet us in the air. And if, if, you, if you have not met Jesus in the air, then you're not really going to meet him. That's that's the, Jesus. This is this is our safeguard. It's a safeguard here. When Jesus meets us, he meets us in the air. You will not meet Jesus at some symposium. You're not going to meet Jesus out in the field. You're not going to meet Jesus in some big sermon that he's going to give on the mount. You're not going to you're not going to meet him any place else. Nowhere. Anybody who says to you that, hey, man, we're, we're going, you know, they send out online, they send you a text. Dude, Jesus is having a Bible conference and he's going to, he's going to, you know, uh, explain uh, salvation to us and all that sort of stuff. You know, uh, the Messiah has come. It's like, no, do not be deceived. It ain't him. The only way you will actually meet Jesus, if, if we're not uh, claimed by death, you meet Jesus, you will meet him in the air. And um, also, and I want to say something to, um, you know, these movies that, uh, that want to do like a um, a screen adaptation of a, a screen adaptation of the rapture, you know, being left behind and stuff like that, which is which I think is cool that they do. I, I love you know when people you know do takes on movies like this, um, you know, and as long as they make it quite clear, it's like so they, we're taking some poetic license in here and stuff like this. But if you want the real story, of course, read the Bible, read the book. Um, I think it's interesting that um, these stories they leave out. The fact that the dead will rise first. It's always like, you know, everybody's like living their lives and something like that. And, you know, somebody's trying to say, hey, man, you might want to get right with God and, and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden, like a few scenes later, everybody disappears. And um, if I may, according to the Bible, it doesn't look like it's going to happen that way. According to the Bible, the dead will rise first. It's not going to be it's not going to be like some big surprise. It's not going to be a big surprise that oh, everybody's just like walking around and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden everybody disappears. It's not going to happen that way. We're actually going to get a little bit of a warning. We're going to get a little bit of a heads up because the dead will rise first. And from what it looks like, okay, from what it looks like in the Bible, the dead are going to meet Christ in the air first. So it sounds like from what I'm just from what I'm reading, it sounds like you will see the people will see glory, glorious bodies. Hovering in the air. The Bible says the dead will rise first. They're going to be glorified. They will be in the air first. I think, and once again, this to me, this speaks, this speaks of God's mercy. As opposed to everybody just disappearing at once, the dead will rise first. And those of us who are here and, and believe, 
The, the, the next one's the jump because after the dead rise, then those who are alive in Christ, we jump next. Okay? But I think in that moment, I think in that moment when the dead rise first, we'll know what we see. We'll know what's going on. And I think in that moment, that's when all the Christians who are alive need to say, hey, when you look up, you need to look at right now. What we've been telling you is going down right now. You need to drop to your nose, drop to your face and repent right now. Do it. Do it. Do not be left behind here. We're about to jump. This your chance, right? You, you, can, you can still meet God in the kingdom, just like that guy who was hanging on the cross with Jesus. You can still be there. That dude didn't do nothing with his life. He was a criminal. He was going to die a criminal. In that moment, Jesus says, you'll be with me. So in that moment, when we see the dead who have risen, right there, we need to be testifying, prophesying. Say, hey, hey, you see what's going on right now? This ain't no freaking UFO. That's not what this is. Don't try to rationalize this. Don't try to justify this. Don't try to make this fit into human understanding. Right now is what we've been telling you. The dead have risen. We're next. You need to drop. Get on your face and repent and join us because we're jumping soon. Okay? So that's God's mercy speaking to us. You'll know, I, because I'm, I'm uh, horrible at being prepared with my notes. I don't know what chapter and verse it is, but you can find it. Just type in Google, the dead will rise first, and it'll take you to the verse. But bottom line is, the dead will rise first. There will be that empirical evidence. That's what people keep saying that they want. Well, I need evidence. I need empirical evidence. Well, dude, you see that person floating around up there? That person is dead. That person is now alive. There is your empirical evidence. Do not try to rationalize this. This is a miracle. A miracle is tasting, taking place for you right now. Get on your face, man. Humble yourself. Humble yourself to the king who defeated death and jump with us. Okay? Um, so moving on. Let's see. Let's see. Where was we? Uh, seven. No, no, no. Yeah. All right. Seven. Was it seven? Man, help me out. Right or no? Where was I at? I wasn't on no first Thessalonians. I'm reading Mark. Melissa, no, I'm playing. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, thank you for putting the, uh, the chapter verse of what I was just talking about uh, just a second ago. Um, we were seeing it. Talk, uh, 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 uh. I'm going to find it in just a second. Dang it. Look at that. You guys got me all off, off my game. I don't even know where I was. Did I talk about being flogged in the synagogues? Yeah, I talked about all that. Okay, go. Oh, of course, I'm in a great tribulation. There it is in like big, bold letters. All right. Um, let's see. All right, so coming the Son of Man. <clears throat> All right, so let's go down to uh, Mark, Mark 13, 24. Uh, but in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. The stars will be fallen from the sky and the celestial powers will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. He will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the end of the earth to the ends of the sky. Okay, so these are things, can we say that these are things that have happened yet? I would, I would venture to say no, this has not happened yet. Um, and a lot of these, we're talking about apocalyptic things, and we're talking about things that are go down in Revelation. And this is one of the things we need to understand about Revelation. Okay? I think, um, and I'm guilty of this myself, you know, and, and, and maybe you guys have thought the same thing, but I've, I've uh, come to understand something about Revelation. Revelation isn't a book that's warning us of what's going to happen in the future. It is. Don't get me wrong. It is. But Revelation is the revelation of the Old Testament, too. So when you're reading the Old Testament and you're like, man. This stuff really is. This is over my head, man. This is this is some far out stuff that's going on in the Old Testament, man. I don't I don't get it. Hey, okay? well, that's why and it's like, man, Lord, I sure could use a revelation on the Old Testament. Well, that's what revelation is. Revelation helps you out with the Old Testament. It's not just a revelation of what's going to happen in the future. It's a revelation into the mysteries of the past. So when you read Revelation, you're actually going to get insight into the Old Testament. And the Old Testament prepares you for what you're going to see in, the, in Revelation and also in the New Testament. The Old Testament itself paints a picture of the coming of Christ. So when you read the Old Testament, no other, other, no, nothing else paints the picture of Christ like the Old Testament. It lets you know exactly who's coming. And then the New Testament lets you know exactly who's coming back. So you don't get it twisted. You will not be deceived. If you read it, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I know how Jesus is returning. He's telling us how exactly how he's going to do it. 
Um, so you don't want to be one because if you're one of those people left behind, people who left behind, they're going to be looking, they're going to be trying to find salvation in, in all of the wrong things. They're going to, they're going to be, they're going to be twisted up in what it is that they're going to be trying to believe. And uh, they're going to, they're going to follow anything. And ultimately they're going to end up following a, 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 a global um, uh, deception, a, 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 pers a persona of a global deception. That's what they're going to end up following. Um, so now we're here when we're talking about those things that I just said, these are things that are coming. And, um, you know, when Jesus comes, when it says, then you will see the son of man, we're going to jump forward a little bit. <clears throat> when he comes, he's going to lay his enemies low with a word. All right. That's all he's going to, it's all it's going to take. We're going to, we're, we'll be in his armies. He's going to have, he's going to have armies of the saints. He's going to have armies of the angels. Jesus is going to come strapped. I mean, you know, it's like it's no one can stand against him, right? And despite all the armies that he's going to have, all it's going to take is him. That's it. And it is a picture of the same way that it was with David. David had armies, right? His, you had the army of Israel ready right before the Philistines, right? And so Goliath is out there taunting everybody. And all it took was David to go out there and stick one right between his eyes and jumped up there and cut his head off, right? All it took was David. When Jesus returns, that is a picture of David because all it's going to take is Jesus. We'll be his armies. We're going to be there. We're going to be witnesses. Him. We're going to be strapped, ready, ready to fight. But all it's going to take is Jesus to spit one word and all his enemies will be destroyed. All of our enemies will be destroyed. Um, so let's see. Nah, 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 nah. Oh, I think this is interesting too. Um, then they will see the, the coming of in the uh, clouds of great power and great glory. He will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the end of the earth to the end of the sky. So when people are, you know, confused, you know, and like I said, I don't, I don't, hey, Cindy, how you doing? Um, CJ, I know that girl. I know that girl from around the way. She was a fine little thing. I had to, I had to go and talk to her. This, this CJ. Yeah, I went to go talk to her. And, uh, you know, got her number and everything. And, uh, uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, so this right here, he will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds. Now, there's a question of, well, when is this tribulation and where will the church be? Where will the church be while this whole thing is taking place? Now, supposedly... And I'm saying supposedly not because I don't believe it. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I absolutely, absolutely know when it's going to happen. Um, good question. Exactly, Danielle. Who is the elect? And um, the elect, I'm speculating, speculating that the elect are the believers, the church. Now, during the tribulation period, when the judgment is poured out, poured out. Now, people keep talking about like, you know, us Christians, you know, we're looking for this rapture as some sort of uh, escape. Escape from from uh, escape from what? Okay, listen, listen. For those who try to say that we Christians are are you know waiting for the rapture because we're trying to escape something, that's a stupid thing to say. That's dumb. I'll tell you why. Why would you say that we Christians are trying to escape something that you yourself don't even believe in? You don't you don't believe that there is a judgment coming. So why would you say that we're trying to escape something that you don't think is coming and escaping to a place that you don't even think exists? All right. So also, when they say that we're cowards who are just seeking to escape. Um, escape this right here is in, in terms of what, you know, it's, it's like, do you think that this world is not so, right now? If we're, if we're talking about escaping we're doing you a favor. You can't stand us. You can't stand our God. You, you ought to be happy that we're waiting for the day that the Lord will remove us from you. You should be as eager for this day of escape than we are. So when we jump on up out of here, that should be like a happy day. That should be a holiday for you. You guys can make it a holiday. You can like celebrate it at the same time you celebrate Halloween or something. I don't know. You know, so now this escape from the judgment to come now, right now, we're already we're already having to deal with people get on our nerves because of what we believe. You know, we believe in this. That's why. Why do you think we call Jesus Christ our savior? 
Yeah, I, 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 ain't too, I ain't too proud to say that, yeah, man, I, I need saving from this world. I need saving from myself. You know, I ain't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not too full of myself to know that. It's like, look, man, there's at some point, uh, I know that despite however smart I assume to be, I don't have the formula in my intellect, in my convictions or anything like that. I don't have the answer to what will bring about world peace, ending hunger and, and, uh, and, and prosperity, peace, joy and prosperity that will, that will, uh, that will be a fit for all. I don't have that information. I know the one who does. And I know that in the state of the way that the world is, um, when, in a state, I was, I was uh, looking at uh, Lynn's question, where is he from? Uh, I wasn't sure who she was talking about. Um, nobody, nobody in this earth. Ah, ah, me, I'm, I'm originally from, uh, from Indiana. Um, nobody in this earth has the answer to what it takes for all of us to get along, right? Even even between you and I, we got different ideas, right? And so nobody, nobody's gonna have that answer. Only Jesus does. And this is gonna work by those who agree. We gotta agree. See, like for me, I agree. It's like, Jesus, you know the answer. And I know that any of us trying to, to make you know our ideas work in the world ain't gonna work. It's gonna take being removed from this place. We're gonna have to be removed. Um, there are, now there are those who are willing to say, look, Jesus, you have the answer and we, and, and we know that you are going to set the world straight. And we know that in order for you to do that, we can't be here. We can't be here when he does that. It, we're just, one, we're just going to get in the way. And two, we'll, we'll end up, we'll be under his judgment. We're not under his judgment. We, we, we're, we're, we're in Christ. God sees us through him. So yeah, we're going to be removed. So now the haters can be like, oh, you guys just want to escape. It's like us us wanting to escape ain't shameful. The person who's fool enough to sit here and think that they can take on the wrath of God, that's embarrassing. You are embarrassing yourself if you think that you will be able to stand in the wrath of God. That ain't bravery. Oh man, you are greatly deceived. You gonna hurt. You gonna hurt. If you think that we have something to be ashamed of because we're saying, because we're gonna back up and say, you know what? We do not want to be in the way of the Lord's wrath. We don't want to be in the way for that, man. And we're, we're, we're letting you know, you don't want to be in the way of the Lord's wrath when it comes. So we're the ones, hey, you can call us cowards if you want to. That's not cowardly, man. That's smart. It's smart to be able to say, you know what, Lord, when you're ready to clean house, we don't, we don't, we don't want to be under your broom, man. We don't want to be under it. We want, we want to be out of your way. So please, yes, take us out of the way when you judge the world. So you ain't going to shame me by trying to say that we want to escape the Lord's wrath. I ain't trying to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with God. You can try to go toe-to-toe -to, -toe to God if you want to. That's, that's not a good idea. Not a good idea, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Then we get down to the parable of the fig tree. Learn this parable from the, pig, from the fig tree. As soon as its branches become tender and sprouts leaves, we talked about the fig tree earlier, that Jesus... Jesus don't, don't play that sort of stuff. Well, it's not my season and stuff like that. It's like, no, no. The, the, the fig tree can produce in or out of season. It can, it can produce a double crop. So the, the fig tree had no excuse, and Jesus doesn't tolerate that from us. If he gives you something to do, and you know what your, your talents are and stuff like that, uh, you do it. You get out there and, and you testify. Uh, you, you let the Lord show through what you're worth. You got to be out there. You got to be present with people and, and, and use your, your, uh, your, your vocation. As a, as a means of, of a glorifying God, when people look on you and say, wow, man, you, you somehow you really seem like uh, there's a peace about you and I want to know what it is, you know? And uh, so Jesus expects us to do that. He, be, he expects us to be fruitful where people know us by our fruits. Um, so get out there and, and be a living uh, um, testimony of, of the gospel. So other people are intrigued and they want to, uh, you know, they want, they want the same. Um, these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will never pass away. Uh, no one knows the day or the hour. Now concerning that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels nor the son except the father. Now, um, I, want, I want to say something to this, you know, a couple of things. I got, I got some flack, you know, for a video that I did because I said that Jesus himself was not omniscient. Okay. And it's like, oh, you know, so big heretic, you know, big heretic 
Um, because Jesus is all knowing. He is too all knowing. It's like, no, Jesus is, is not all knowing. Um, it's telling you right here that Jesus is not all knowing because the son doesn't even know when this is going to come down. Okay? He doesn't know. Um, when Jesus was on the cross and he asked, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, autumn, right off the bat, it's like as if I had never read it. I got a whole bunch of people like saying, so he was, he was, he was speaking what David spoke when he said, you know, going back to Psalms, says, yeah, yeah, I know that. I know that. But he can't quote that without still asking the question. He's still asking God. Yeah, I know. And I got it. He's quoting David, but he's still asking for himself. My God, why have you forsaken me? Because he didn't know. He did not know. Because he wasn't totally omniscient. Just like when he was in the garden and he's praying. And he's saying, God, if there's any other way, can this cup pass for me? Can we do this another way? Because he didn't know, right? Now there's power in that. People think that that's a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of weakness. It's power, right? Jesus told you, man, I'm fully man. I'm the son of man. I'm a, I'm a flesh and blood human being. Ow. No, no, it didn't. Hey. Jesus like, look, man, I'm, I'm flesh and blood. That's what makes Jesus the, the, the hardcore dude that he was, right? A fallible human being. He in complete, if Jesus absolutely knew the score, if he knew the whole thing that was going to come down, he couldn't truly be obedient. His obedience was in his faith because no matter what, he's like, Lord, not my will, but yours. I don't fully get this. I don't fully understand. But in total faith, I have to know that when I go to that cross, man, you're going to bring me back. You know, I know that you're going to redeem me. I know that you're going to redeem all those that I'm dying for. I know it. Right. I, 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 I know it in my heart. I may not see the full thing in my mind. I don't know it. That's why I have to ask. But, you know, it's like you got a lot of people, you know, through through a lens of piety, want to try to exalt Z, Jesus to this humanistic idea of the pedestal that he should be on. Is it no, Jesus knew everything. He knew he knew what was going on. No, man, he didn't. That would not be obedience. He had to go in faith. That's why he asked God, why have you forsaken me? Because he didn't fully know. But what does he say? Into your hands, I commit my spirit, meaning that. I don't know what's fully going on, but God, I am fully committed to you. My life, my everything is in your hands. I'm fully committed to you. Your will be done. So, um, you know, this idea that, that Jesus, you know, just knew the whole score. It's like, no, no, that, that, that doesn't speak to his humility. That doesn't speak to uh, the real power of his faith. Um, also, and I'll, I want to I want to say something else uh, concerning this. Um, let's see. Hold on, hold on. Now, concerning the day or hour, no one else uh, needed an angel. Oh, this is a, a little spooky thought that I had. Don't you think it's, I think it's kind of strange that Jesus, the son of God, he doesn't know. He doesn't know when this is coming down. But I would say, and, and I, before I complete saying this, he, Jesus, the son, it says the son doesn't know. But it seems like the devil does. Because the devil's the one who's scared because his time is short. I think that's kind of strange. The devil is like, oh, man, I'm freaking out, man, because time is getting kind of short. I got to do what I got to do, and I got to do it now. So it's almost like the devil is in on it. You know, the devil knows what's up. But the devil doesn't know the exact date, but the devil does know the uh, the indicators. Just like we're giving a heads up of the, of the indicators, the devil will be giving a heads up of the indicators, too. And, uh, you know, and as far as, like, Jesus goes, you know, the Lord... <laughs> The Lord, man, is is uh, is itching to set things right. Don't think for a second that he's not, man. He's he's not he's not you know indifferent. He's not just sitting back and you know because we I know we got people out there who wonder, you know, um, is God you know is he an is he going to answer us? Is he going to do anything? You know, has he forgotten us and stuff like that? And uh, the Lord had already made it clear in blood that. He's going to fix everything. That's a promise that he wrote in blood. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I, I imagine there's people out there, you know, who may feel helpless. Um, you know, they feel helpless and stuff like that when they're thinking about their loved ones. You know, you may, you know, you may, maybe you got a, um, 
um, a loved one who's suffering from an incurable disease, uh, and they're just, you know, or, or people that you know that are suffering, um, and it doesn't look good. And it may, and you may be praying and praying, and um, and I know, and I, and, and the, the feeling of being helpless, you know, when you feel helpless, like you can't do nothing. It's like, dang man, it's like I, I hate seeing this person suffer, and I, I can't help them. All I can, I could be like some some sort of comfort and be like some sort of support. But you know what I would really like to do? I would really like to take their pain away. That's what I really want to do. You know, I, I don't want to see you suffer anymore. And um, and I imagine that's got to be... Actually, no, I don't have to imagine this. It's written. Um, this is what it's like for Jesus. This is what it's always been like for Jesus. You know, this is what it's always been like for God. Imagine, now, I mean, imagine imagine this. Imagine this. We actually... I, I can't, you know, you, know you, 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 can't, you can't take your loved one's pain away. You can't do it. Right? And I know it's gotta, it's gotta, it's gotta burn. It's gotta hurt. It's gotta hurt when you, when you, when you see somebody that's suffering with something and you want to take their pain away, but you, you can't. That sucks. It sucks that you can't take somebody's pain away. Well, you know what? For Jesus, it's much, much, much worse because Jesus actually can take the pain away. Imagine what that would be like. Imagine if you could actually take somebody's pain away, but you are restrained by your own virtues. You can't. You can't do it yet. Right? This is the way it's been since the beginning. Imagine when, 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 when God creates man. When God creates man. The moment God breathed life in Adam's nostrils, he put his own life at stake. He put, the son, he put the life of his son at stake by giving Adam life. Jesus then already gave up his life. Gave up his life, right? When Adam, when Adam, Christ was already, he was pretty much as good as sacrifice once Adam was created. When Adam and Eve were created, it was, it was, it was almost like it was just a matter of time. It's free will, right? They have the free will choose to, basically, it's the free will choice on whether Jesus whether Christ is going to live or if he's going to die. So when Adam was told, man, don't eat, don't eat from this, from this tree. Cause if you do, y'all are going to die. Now I ain't going to sit here and try to lecture you on that, but you're not only are you going to die. I shouldn't have to lecture you on it because considering everything that you've got, this shouldn't even be an issue. But if you eat from this tree and if you disobey, man, you're going to die. All the, all the descendants who follow you going to die. Oh yeah. And my son is going to have to die too, but I don't want to lay all that guilt trip on you now, but just don't eat from that tree. Okay. So now when we feel helpless, right, we feel helpless because we can't help the people that we love. We want to remove disease from them and stuff like that. This is what it's like for God. God had to sit by and watch. I mean, he didn't have to. He could have ended the whole thing, but then there'd be no us. So imagine the helplessness of God restrained by his own virtue. The helplessness of God, but because he loves us so much and wants us to have the free will choice in order for this experiment to work, it has to be the free will choice. It has to be. So God helplessly, right, watches as Adam and Eve basically become the first suicidal couple. They ate the fruit and now God watches. Who can, who can solve this whole thing? But he can't do it in the time of our choosing. He has to do it out of the mercy, out of the mercy of saying, I cannot restore everything until there is a critical mass of people who will believe. I can't do it yet because if I, if I do it now, that means I got to wipe a whole bunch of people out. There's going to be too many casualties. And I don't want, I don't want people to have to go to hell if they don't have to. So some people are going to have to suffer so I can save as many people as possible. So even right now, when we're feeling like, you know, man, I, I want to take this person's pain away. I, want, I wish I could cure this person of cancer. I wish I could cure this person of, of, their, of their heart disease. I wish I could cure this person of Alzheimer's. I wish I could cure this person, of, you know, this kid who has leukemia. I wish I, I wish I could help this person just take their pain away. I wish I could do that. But I don't have the power. 
Well, imagine what Jesus feels like because he's still waiting. He doesn't know. He doesn't know the day when he's supposed to come down and throw down. He doesn't know. So he's waiting. Wait, wring his hands, say, Lord, come on, God, let me get in. Let me get in, man. I, I'm really, I really, I really would like to come down there and set things straight. I want to heal. I want to heal the people of earth. I want to heal our creation, man. Can we do this? Can we do this yet? Because he can. But he's got to wait for us. We got to get it. We got to get our head right. So until there's as many people as, as he can save as possible. So Jesus sympathizes. Because he's the one who actually does have it. And he will. He gave us that promise in blood. In blood he gave us that promise. He's going to set everything straight. Everybody's gonna, everybody and everything is going to be made perfect. Those who cling to him. And then we will, we will enjoy perfect paradise forever. Right? That's a promise. Made in blood. Um, so let's see. That being said. Yeah. Basically the, the last point of that is be alert. Be alert. Be ready. Be ready to party with the Lord. All right, y'all. I'm going to let you guys go ahead and get back to your Sunday. I'm going to finish off my coffee. And you guys have a fantastic week. You hear? Thank you so much for tripping out with me. Hope it was fun. It was fun for me. And I will see you guys, what, was it Thursday? Okay. So you guys have a groovy week. I will see you guys uh, Thursday night for some more Bible tripping. All right. Thanks, y'all. Night.